You're listening to the Women Talking About Learning podcast. My name is Andrew Jacobs. Welcome. Hello everyone and welcome to this episode, the passion one, of the Women Talking About Learning podcast. This episode, as all the episodes are, was suggested by our audience. The difference this week is that the audience have become the guests. Our two guests are Jane Haverson and Lorna Leeson. Jane is a qualified executive coach and has over 25 years experience in the people development field mainly in leadership and career development. She's interested in what makes people tick, why they choose the work they do, and general well-being. She launched a Wellbeing Wednesday series, which examines how to stay well, particularly during a pandemic, paying attention to mind, body, soul and work. You might recognise Jane's voice as she was on the imposter syndrome episode. Lorna also has a consultancy, Little Tent, And she set that up because she believed there was a better way for business to work for people and to shape work for herself. Lorna offers coaching and people and change consultancy to organisations and leaders who want to make positive, impactful change happen. This episode was recorded in January 2020 via Zoom. We had a couple of sound problems, but please don't let them affect your enjoyment of the podcast. I'm delighted to welcome Jane and Lorna to women talking about learning. I've known both of them for a while online, but had never met them, so to speak. And I really appreciated the chance to listen to this conversation. As always, I'm in the room when these are recorded, and you might hear Jane and Lorna mention me. I haven't, as I always promise, edit or remove anything from the podcast. This is Women Talking About Learning. This is Jane and Lorna talking about passion. Morning, at Lorna. How are you today? I'm really well, Jane. How are you doing? Have you still got snow? Well, it's nearly all gone, um, but we're forecast more. It's like minus, I reckon it's definitely in the minus out there this morning. When I took oh. the dogs out, my nose definitely knew. It was like shining bright red. <laughs> <laughs> by the time I got back so uh, yeah a bit too much information there for you so I believe Fab. today we're t- talking about passion we are one of my favorite topics <laughs> I know <laughs> and uh, is it useful just to kind of help I suppose help the listeners um to understand how we came to this topic because um <laughs> it, it was very specific wasn't it <laughs> by a rant <laughs> Yeah, Twitter rant. Um, I think it was a video by Scott Galloway, which I, I, mind, I don't know the title of it, so I'm, I'm going to struggle with posting that particular thing in the show notes, but so it was something along the lines of, well, the key message was, don't follow your passion. Yes. Um, which then kind of helped us to, yes, to explore it that It set me topic. off like a rocket on Twitter, Twitter <laughs> quite frankly. Yeah. Um, I'll try and be more um, measured today. Uh, so I, I, I had a little um, look at this video before, and it's called something like it's promoted all over the internet as the best career advice that you'll ever get, um, which that's just guaranteed to make me go, hmm, really? Um, and he says, don't f- follow your passion. He then goes on to define passion really interestingly as he talks about um the luxury goods market food entertainment sports he says you can't make a living from those things but if they're the things that people are passionate about you can't make a living from them there is so much in that that I know you and I have unpicked both on Twitter and in one-to-one conversations isn't there what's your take on what he's just said there yeah it's interesting and I wonder actually so when you because I did a a Google search not long after that because I just thought right is this is this the accepted view now (laughs) what's going on out there and there's like three or four different male perspectives actually generally speaking it does tend to be male and the one that stood out for me was Cal Newport who just exactly the same as Scott Galloway said something along the lines of um 
people end up loving what they do through just hard work um, <laughs> and success equals it's nothing to do with passion it's just about mm. work, working hard <laughs> and for me it was this kind of paradigm about to be successful it's all about um, working really hard and earning lots of money and there was no wiggle room in that whatsoever e even to the point I think with Scott uh, sorry with Cal Newport's session that he was going well you know people have gone on to, to run their own uh, photography studio or engaged in acting or whatever and they've just been really miserable because when they've realized that you know that, that they might actually have to do some work or hard work and their dreams are then shattered and I just sat there thinking oh boy yeah because they're trying to squish their passion almost into this paradigm of this is the only way to be successful it's all about money making anyway I'll I'll stop <laughs> so I'll let you get an edge a word in edgeway <laughs> <laughs> so no I mean please I I completely agree and I in in the you're it's really interesting that you say that that's Cal Newport's take because Scott Galloway says he kind of equates he says passion he says just get rich buy a fast car and then marry someone good looking and oh my. there's so much in there so um I'm going to be bold here and I'm going to say that if you are equating passion with um buying nice things or um profile status um being able to get a um a, a good looking spouse those are trauma responses to something else that happened way back when like that's the wrong tree to be barking up that's that's nothing to do with passion um but what what is really interesting is that i think he i think they are barking up the wrong tree and you and i have had a conversation about are uh, are they just disconnected from their their kind of their true um internal truths you know those internal truths this part of you that really knows what we're here on 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 this earth to, to to really do which is about human connection and meaning um and purpose and are they just living in their heads a little bit but there is something that um scott galloway says which i think he's almost getting there he says find something in your work that gives you joy so you can make enough money to follow your true passion as you get older now that first part he was nearly there right <laughs> connecting with the thing that gives you joy that's that's I, the, I can get on board with yeah this idea that actually you know we've got to wait until we're older right and be able to do yeah. it's almost like so that is just that's crazy right i mean pay your dues now oh well, but what i'm if you don't get older you know we're right. living in a time which is very uncertain we've got to like i mean none of, none of that is about today is it none of it it's either backward looking or forward looking i don't know there's an identity piece for me here about i, I think you hit the nail on the head about the trauma thing because <laughs> oh when we deny when we deny that very essence of self that's going to come out somewhere along the line. You know, I think it was yeah. Brené Brown that says, you know, um, emotions that are hidden aren't benign. They metastasize over time Absolutely. and become, you know, something quite, ugh. you know, and these, yeah. by the way, these might be people that are leading teams, <laughs> you know, yeah. leading from a place of trauma and don't, don't feel that, don't, you know, embrace that passion. Don't actually explore what your strengths are. That for me feels really dangerous, and and not not only that, but this this is the message that's going out to um, university kids. You know, this is. I think that's like, really irresponsible, you know, Jane. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's so irresponsible and it's sad. I feel sorry for Scott, Scott Galloway and Scott Galloway, both of them. <laughs> yeah, um, I, <laughs> uh, I feel I feel sorry for them. And I, I suppose so you and I are um, our coaches. We work a lot with leaders and I don't know about you, but I spend a good amount of my time working with very senior leaders in organisations, trying to unpick that um, that narrative, that paradigm. Um, because they've done everything that Scott Galloway and Cal Newport have told them to do. They've worked really, really hard. They've dedicated themselves to the pursuit of success and achievement. And they've got to the place where they thought they would then be happy. And they're not. They don't feel fulfilled. They don't really feel like they're bringing um, the best of themselves into the work environment. They don't feel like they've got good work-life balance. They feel like they've neglected, you know, some of some of the 
um, the senior executives I work with are on marriage number two or three. They're you know, re reconnecting with their kids. They're reconnecting with their families. They're reconnecting with who they are and what um, um, and what they really want from life. And the really sad thing is that they've done exactly what Scott Galloway is telling them to do. It's, which is, you know, make as much money as you can, get some status so that you can then follow what you really want as you get older. And of course, by that point, I almost get a sense of grief um, from people that I work with who are in that situation because they're grieving the loss of, of everything that could have been throughout their life. And they're realizing that I say this an awful lot, both to clients and just generally, nobody ever puts your net worth or your job title on your gravestone. That's just not what is, is written. When people talk about the impact you had throughout your life, they do not talk about the status you achieved or the size of your bank balance. They talk about, you know, the things that you were talented at, maybe the things that you brought to the world and, and what you left behind in the form of your impact on other people. Absolutely spot on. And it, I, I wonder as well, when we're kind of looking out there at the kind of the work, the workplace as a whole. I mean, I've just done, started doing a series um, for well-being and um, so the la latest labour force surveys look at, at um, anxiety depression mm. and just general stress in the workplace <clears throat> and it's something like it's up by 30 percent from the year before not surprisingly because of covid <clears throat> but this was actually 2019 2020 so we're not actually into the worst covid bit yet Mm. So it's the year before it really took hold. So there's already something going on with just how mm. miserable people are at work. And I think it's that it's we take our heads to work. We don't take our hearts. Mm. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's let's just cut you off from here. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure I guess I should do it for the re for the readers, for the listeners. I'm kind of <laughs> doing a sign across my neck there. You know, it's. It's, yeah, we're, we're nothing more than head taxes, aren't we? Nothing to do with the heart. Mm. Nothing to do with the heart whatsoever. And oh, and this is what passion's about, isn't it? It's about engaging with our whole selves to say, actually, I'm more than just what I think. Mm. I'm a whole person. I can bring an entire raft of things to the workplace it's not just about what's going to make you money or it's not just about productivity because actually if you tapped into <laughs> some of that latent uh, i don't know what to call it latent energy my mm. god that would be a really powerful wouldn't it i've seen it in action oh. so i know it is <laughs> well here's the thing so the thing or one thing that um really kind of gets me thinking about this uh, jane is i uh, as part of some of my coaching work and studies, I studied um, a little neuroscience and looking at um, what psychologists and neuroscientists broadly tend to think as being the eight core human emotions of um, sadness, shame, disgust, anger, fear, love, joy, trust. Um, and the first ones that I talked about tend to be those survival threat response emotions. And the thing about those is that because they're tailored to survival and threat response, the, the things that um, they're just about stay, staying alive, about beating a, a threat. And then the, the three others, the love, joy, trust, are the ones where things like, um, you know, excitement, connection, uh, in terms of neurochemicals, oxytocin, dopamine, um, serotonin, that's where the joy, right? That's where that yeah. stuff sits. Yeah. And um, broadly speaking, you can't have those things if you're living in in the other world and organisations and, and work. When I first ex explored this, and I'm doing a kind of a, um, I'll share it in the show notes because I've uh, there's a, a model that I I use with with clients which shows this on a spectrum, which helps. But um, when I talk about this from an organizational perspective, I talk about engagement and motivation because engagement and motivation are manifestations of trust, joy, connection, which is the stuff in that um, the, the right hand side of that emotional spectrum, if I were going to draw it out for you. And actually, while you're feeling things like um, mainly cortisol, right, that's the neurochemical that's running through your system when you're in fear or anger or shame or disgust. If you think about the way that we talk about 
um, you know, work and the, the way that we frame it, particularly the way work and life has felt for the past year, that's, the, that's a, a fairly prevalent way of, of being. And I certainly know lots of um, senior executives and successful people who have kind of lived there and driven themselves from there. But you need the other stuff for innovation. You need it for connection. You need it for engagement. You need it to um, be able to get out of bed in the morning and um, and feel energized and, and motivated to do stuff. So um, this is very I like the do disclaser stuff around conversational yeah. intelligence. How do you actually yeah. have decent conversations with with people that you work with to get the very most out of them I mean she talks about the tell yell sell syndrome which is right <laughs> over on that I don't know which way we're looking looking around but right over on that kind of cortisol spiking I you know in, yeah it's cortisol spiking tell sell you know yell at someone and yeah we've okay we've been in crisis mode slightly so there's been a little bit more command and control I think they're definitely seeing that in the NHS with some of the clients that I've worked with. A little mm -hmm. bit more command and control to start with. Absolutely. We need to go here. We need to go here now. Yeah. However, <laughs> that's not a, a recipe to say, OK, leaders, let's let's engage with bad behaviour now and do everything in that way. We now need to perhaps think about how are we going to set up vaccination sites? You need that. Court, you need the kind of the oxytocin level to spark the innovation, to get everyone working together. So it's it's a little bit of, yeah, how what's the mixture of chemicals that we need in this? And we've got mm. we've gone off piece really from passion, well, haven't we? Let me bring it back, <laughs> back then because that. <laughs> well no, I suppose the reason I the reason I mentioned it was because um I think if you 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 think about the things that people do know to be important in business and we talk about productivity but actually I hear more organizations talking about creativity innovation problem solving being able to respond really quickly to a very volatile and changing um, macro environment if you like how do we help people feel safe and secure and engaged and want to be here we've got generations of people coming into the workplace who want to feel a connection connection to something all of that stuff happens on what I would call the right hand side of that emotional spectrum. So you need to be creating an environment where people feel able to have joy and trust and love and connection. And I remember using the word love about three years ago with um, a very senior executive that I was working with on a transformation program and, and talking to him about this emotional spectrum. And he said to me, it was American, not, um, East Coast American, went, Lorna, never use that word with me. And that's really bad American accent. He said, never use that word in a work context. People don't need to love each other. They just need to, you know, respect each other. And I think that's fundamentally untrue, actually. You, so if you think about, for me, passion is the equation of love plus joy. It's what I love and what I enjoy doing. And actually, that's as much about your limbic system as it is your cognitive system. And it's your limbic system that's really working with those right hand side emotional um, kind of drivers. So that's the stuff that actually makes us human. Why would you deny that? Why would you just go, no, I'm just a cognitive brain on a stick until I'm 50 and then I'm allowed to be human. I mean, what? I, I'm, I'm, I'm clapping and going, yes, high five. <laughs> Absolutely that. And, 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 it's, and I think you've hit the nail on the head really, Lorna, because it is you leaving humanity at the door often when you come to yes. a workplace. And I think that's where the problems are and um, that it's not OK to be human. And actually, the, pa the passion aspect of it does. It's almost like they're frightened. Is there a fear mm -hmm. there about that yes. emotion? Yeah, there is for sure. A fear response to an intense, you know, I've got an intense desire or enthusiasm for. I remember being told quite early on in my career that I was too much, you know, that <laughs> too, too giddy, too out there, too, just too damn and excited or too <laughs> enthusiastic. How can you be too enthusiastic about something? But actually, that's what they were pointing to. Mm. Like, can we just dial you down, please? Because your emotions yeah. are showing. Which is yeah. why the word professionalism really makes me itch. When we talk <laughs> about a professional environment, I think what we're really meaning is, can you just like, Dumb. can you just dial down all the pieces that make you you until you go home or you're 50? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then you've got, you've earned it. You can be eccentric when, you, when you've made it, but not right now, thanks. 
and where does that, all that emotion go you know so and again when you're thinking about exactly. I mean that, that fantastic podcast actually you recommended to me with Mark Bennett and mm. they were talking about you know we, we have struggled recognizing emotions naming them so that's actually yeah. why we why we then don't know what to do with them if you like when when they come up for people but actually until we get good at that stuff we're never going to move yeah. the needle on this and actually we're going no. to continue to de deny the passion I think and that's the very that's the very oh, secret sauce mm. that makes an organization really great so when you when you're looking at some of the startups around like Zappos and that was all about passion you know when mm -hmm. some of the regenerative companies that are around that's again all about passion they they bring their passion to work it's all about saving the planet you know doing the mm -hmm. right thing Helena is it Helena Clayton I love what about she loving does. Leadership. Oh, so do I. Yeah. You know, and Jen, Jen Anderson as well. All about yeah. leadership cultures. This is people wearing the passion on the sleeve day in, day out and making a difference, you know? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And and I, I think um, what's really interesting for me is that we go through this. So we end, if we if we think about this as a paradigm that says, let's take Scott Galloway's paradigm of says, find, you know, make enough money to follow your true passion later put put it on ice and just come in and work really hard and be successful um, and being successful in the context of most organizations is about metrics and productivity and financial and commercial achievement and status and recognition and then we get to a point when we we, we spend an awful lot of money as organizations saying oh how do we engage people um, or actually more and more uh, wider stakeholders want to see organizations that are committed to more than just the bottom line. They want to see organizations that, um, you know, have a, a responsibility to their uh, community, to the environment, to the generations that are coming into, into the workforce to um, and very, very many places, social, social equity. And so organizations are having this existential crisis, almost they go, and they realize they've lost passion and they try and retrofit passion in in the form of purpose and value statements and <laughs> and i just think if you shifted your paradigm a little and you allowed people to connect with that passion day in day out um identify more with what it is about a role or an organization or a piece of work or an outcome that really drives you and connects to the thing that makes you 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 could you probably never have to do another values um, rollout ever again, right? Or another purpose mission statement ever again. Yeah, does yeah, so Andrew's just asked an interesting question. You know, does the organizer how does an organization lose their passion? And and, and actually I've got another question that kind of was kind of bounced off that the, the kind of the, the overview you've just given there, really, Norma, is that does the system, the system of success, if you like make it almost impossible for companies to keep their passion or to keep that purpose because we're all we're not all operating in a bubble we have to be mm. out there and currently the, you know the system is very much a capitalist model it is it's profit first it's G, everything gets measured it's gdpr um mm. led it's got yeah. nothing you know it's got nothing to do with love actually or planet or people there's somewhere mm. down the, the to-do list uh, mm. currently how we work i mean yeah how well, do we how do we ensure in the future that passion isn't lost is that god we need to work outside the boundaries perhaps of the organization on the system as well i don't know how on to the system that. on 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 some of the people who have the most influence in the system and i suppose i was just reflecting you know so what's driving that there's still people driving driving this right there's still humans driving this and so i would go back to if you're a venture capitalist or a private equity um investor or a ceo what is it that's driving you to put um profit um acquisition of wealth above the stuff that really if we were to sit in a dark room for a little while with just ourselves and our consciences we would know is not the important stuff we know that even those guys don't have that stuff put on their gravestone but of course there is something driving them in the pursuit of that and i think that is more and more and i i lived through a um 
an acquisition of a, a business that was built off the back of passion by a single entrepreneur and their story and their spirit lived very much through the values of that business. And they were bought overnight by an American organization who's, uh, who were, were private equity backed and, um, and focused only on, um, on, on growth. And it became very clear that the purpose and the mission, the passion of the original entrepreneur had just gone overnight. And so it was really sad, actually, to see the people left behind. They were almost grieving for the loss of that passion. And what had killed it was this myth that actually the profit is more important. Um, Andrew's just posted a really mm. useful and provocative question, which is what if the passion for them is the acquisition of wealth? I'm going to be bold and say false profit. Keep asking. Yeah. Keep looking. It's not that. Why, what's important about the acquisition of wealth would be the coaching question that I would ask them. Yeah, what, yeah quite. <laughs> yeah. What does it give you? Because actually yeah. they're trying to, often sitting behind that is a need for something mm -hmm. that they're going to yeah. replace with money or, an, or a, a thing. Yeah. Actually, we all know that things do not bring you happiness. No. We've been sold a pup, actually, haven't we? This This entire paradigm that we've been living in <laughs> since the industrial revolution I mean why do we go to work actually you know what's that for it's to yeah. make a few people really rich and the rest of us miserable as it seems when you look at the HSE right <laughs> so, I think that's you know, the truth in that <laughs> we've got to look we've got to you know create something better here and I think we're yeah. getting there we're lifting the lid on some of this because we're starting to have these types of conversations and that can only be brilliant you know I, I personally think I just yeah. worry about your Scott Galloway's your Cal Newport's your Dan Cables these are really mm. influential males that are telling the future generation that actually ignore ignore that passion thing ignore that love thing actually because that's what it's about with that love. love yeah yeah ignore that and just focus on the success well mm. sorry chaps you're wrong but they've said it overtly and directly they've mm. said it's a um that success is a love substitute right that's what they're actually saying <laughs> they've said it out loud um and actually that's just the truth of it isn't it success is just a love substitute if you look if your passion is the acquisition of wealth and you keep asking yourself why at some point you're likely to get back to the answer that i'm trying i'm trying to gain some form of sig significance or substitute for a you know a, a, a lack of something inside that i really need and it's not um it's not cash <laughs> That you really it comes need back to the trauma i'm dying to do my trauma one actually it's, it comes back to that early childhood stuff doesn't it yeah um, andrew's asking who are the influential women we should listen to about this um oh, that's a good question that's a really good question i mean there's an obvious one which you've have you spoken about um who is brene brown who does lots mm. of research on um the emotions, the difficult emotions in business and leadership, the ones that we try and shy away from because I think they are more connected to this thing that we've just been talking about. Susan David um, as well. Susan David. Yeah. She she a very like Mark um, Brackett um, does a lot of work on emotional agility and why that's important and why we should be talking about emotions at work. And mm -hmm. And that actually there is no such thing as a bad, a bad emotion, you know, so some mm. things that just get labeled at work. We're not allowed to bring anger to the workplace or, um, you know, we, you know, don't cry because if you cry, <laughs> you're just weak, you know, so it's all that kind of stuff, really. We, we, we label a person or, rather than just saying they're having an emotion. It's not the experience of the emotion that counts or the, the situation. It's that person. And actually, we all have emotions. We just, yeah, I just find that really fascinating. So she's brilliant. And I think also um, for people that want to see a different, a different narrative, if you like, to the GDPR narrative is I'd, I'd look up Marilyn Waring. She's a New Zealand economist. Um, and she absolutely trounces GDPR, you know, <laughs> And it's all, it's very much, it was set up by pale, stale males, you know, it's that. Uh, I can't pronounce the... her name and we should put her in the show notes, but there's an economist, another female economist who I've heard speak on this. Um, and I'm not even going to begin to try and pronounce her name. Um, 
but she talks very much about this shift in paradigm from GDP to um, to actually measuring oh, true I value and help. Uh, then, didn't I? I've got me. <laughs> Sorry, I meant GDP. Sorry, Lord. That's okay. <laughs> we can, it's just between friends. I mean, <laughs> same. Um, <laughs> so, but I was just reflecting on this question from Andrew, and actually, I think part of the challenge here is honestly the voices of people like Scott Calloway and um, uh, Cal Newport and. Uh, they're so strong, they're so loud, and they're so um, unempathetic and compassionate that it's actually quite hard, particularly if you're female, to gain traction and to feel heard and to have the same level of influence. Uh, there's not as many of them. Lots of women, um, I think, get... Uh, I, what comes to mind, actually, is the experience of Amy Cuddy when she first started researching... Um, the impact of uh, physical presence on, on your neurochemistry and therefore on your um, on your emotions and your performance um, through things like power posing. And she was absolutely torn apart mm. for her research. Um, we'll describe the experience she went through as bullying. She wasn't saying anything more, you know, she was actually saying something that was grounded in a whole lot more research than Cal Newport is saying. Absolutely. In fact, hasn't she and, since <laughs> been pro hasn't it also been proven? Because first of all, they tore it down and then actually they had to put it back up again. I mean, yeah, right, because she went out, they they they, they did yeah. some more robust research because she's a, a you know a, an extremely intelligent, well credentialed um academic researcher. She went away and did her homework again and um and came back to the table. But what the response to her was really was really notable for me mm. and I think if you're a woman who knows some of this stuff to be true and is, is looking to evidence it or prove it elsewhere Brene Brown was told very early in her research career she talks about this don't go there don't research shame um, it will be the death of your career because people don't want to talk about it wow. and shame is so deeply connected to the the need for connection and acceptance and love that that's what you're triggering when you start it's easier to talk about anger and possibly even fear and some of those those things you know um but uh, and we we tie it up in this phrase in business and research which we'll call it incivility which is um bonkers but i think um the reason back to andrew's question that i'm struggling to think of good influential women is i actually do think it's harder to be a woman who has this hypothesis or wants to explore this paradigm and look for the evidence to back it up and be taken seriously and heard and um, you're held to higher standards. And I, I look at Amy Cuddy as an example there. And another Amy, um, Amy Brand's done a lot of work on neuroscience, yeah. especially around the coaching area. And I think that's mm -hmm. really helpful. And then you've got people at the other end of the spectrum, people like, is it Kim Scott, who's done um, work on radical candor? Again, I'm, I, I wonder about, mm. I, yeah, I wonder about the paradigm there, you know, so, I, yeah. I, I think I'm, she's I'm done a good kind of way to paradigm. work within the paradigm, hasn't she? I think she's yeah. done a really good way to work within the paradigm and to nudge people towards um, what Brene Brown would talk about, that kind of courageous vulnerability piece, right? That's radical candor in its essence. Absolutely, yeah. And, yeah. and for me, it's, it's a coaching model. You know, it's that, it's what coaches do. It's that... You know, it's that challenging but supportive. That's what yeah. it's, that's what it's about. But actually, in a way that speaks to leaders. So I find that really interesting. Ah, we've got, we've gone just, off piece. We do. Go we've off gone piece a bit, way, don't we? way. I mean, we're so far <laughs> off piece. I just I don't even know if we're on the mountain anymore. But I quite like where we are. <laughs> um, oh. Andrew has asked, "How do we help women build their passion?" Oh, oh my goodness, um, this is wrapped up in so much for me. It's wrapped yeah. up in feminism. It's wrapped up in the thing that you hinted at, which is that the paradigm of work is very often white, male, Northern European. Mm. Um, it starts what do you think? For me, though, I think it's about education. I think it starts at school. I think it mm. starts in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When we're suddenly, I mean, you know, I was taught, I well, Okay, so I had passions as a young child. I'll go there with this, even though it might, I might cry. You know, I was I was a ballet dancer. That's what I wanted to do. You know, I, I got to the age thirteen, and actually, 
my mum and dad couldn't afford the lessons anymore. It was a really expensive school. It was a boarding school for the Royal Ballet, so clearly it wasn't going to be, <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't cheap. And dad was just a steel worker. But their paradigm of success was you go and get an education and you don't be like us. Don't do a trade or a thing, you know, like, yeah, mum didn't work. Yeah. Go and get yourself an education. That's what's important. Leave yeah. that passion and go and do the, the hard work that Carl, yeah. Carl Newport says, you know. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I've loved my career, but it still makes me cry when I watch ballet on telly. Uh, and and there it is, folks. So we're yeah. not taught it at school. We're actually taught to almost leave our passions early. We're absolutely taught to leave our passions early, aren't we? Yeah. We're said that's, in fact, I mean, people who follow me on, on Twitter, and I apologise for this if you do, but, you know, you'll see me sing and occasionally post a video of me dancing at the age of 40 um, a few years back on online and the reason the reason that I do that is the same reason for you so as you is that um <clears throat> I was told uh, so I also had a part I wasn't talented enough to go to the Royal Ballet School at all but I was I was pretty good but I was told you're smart Lorna you should go into an academic pursuit in fact the only reason I did four A levels at a time when nobody did four A levels was because I wanted to do dance A level and they forced me to do business studies as well and that's a nice metaphor for the reason that I stopped the things that I was really passionate about after I left school, which is what we tell people. We say, yeah, you can do all the stuff you're passionate about and then you have to grow up. Mm. So whether it's women actually or men, Andrew, in answer to your question, and I think um, there is a good connection here to lifelong learning, which is really about that continuous pursuit of the stuff that, may, that makes you passionate. And the reason I came back to singing and dancing later in life is that I knew that that piece was missing. And the really interesting thing for me is that since I've done that, there have been learnings and applications in my professional life that have just paid so many dividends in direct and indirect ways. So the answer would be nurture those passions from very small. Don't do, even if you think you're, you're developing them, anything you say to a, a young woman along the lines of, yeah, you can carry on doing that, but you won't make a living out of it. Or maybe you can take classes, you know, as an adult, whatever else. Don't squish that dream. Don't. It's it's actually bordering on cruelty to a young woman to say there's a thing that you're brilliant at or passionate about or love, but you're not allowed anymore. You've got to grow up. I think it's the same for both men and women. I don't think there is a, a divide True. here. I think we, we do it equally um to the to, gen, to the genders um, yeah and in fact to some extent it's even it could possibly be even more difficult for men to say do you know what I want to be a potter uh, or you know I want to go to ballet you know we, we yeah had, we, you know it's even more difficult perhaps um but we don't give any you know there seems to be one view of yeah. the world and okay maybe that's my romantic view you know it would, it would have been just nice to have had the choice I didn't, mm. I, I wasn't presented with a choice. I was told that this was what it was. Yeah. And so then you're picking up later in life around, mm. okay, perhaps I can get that in. Because it doesn't go. That's the thing about passion. It isn't just <laughs> a feeling. It doesn't just dissipate. It's the difference between, I don't know. It's For me, it's like, okay, a lust. That's lust. Look, it is a love. Passion real passion for, for things that are just in your soul. They, it's like real love. It's not romantic love. It's real love. Um, lust goes. Yeah. yeah. And, and this, this, the passion for work doesn't. Yeah. And I think, um, I think you're right. I think it's a double bind. I think it plays on women as, as well as men. I think in very many ways it traps, traps adults, um, regardless of your your gender or your sex in in lots of different ways you know men get forced to get, do a, a job that pays lots of money so you can be the breadwinner um, uh, and I know some very successful men who have got some talents that they put to one side um, I I've got a, an image of my in my head um, of a friend of mine who um, plays a musical instrument and that musical instrument is on show in in their house and untouched and I know that it's his passion I know that it's something that he loves to do not his only passion um, but I think there is a paradigm of okay put that to one side now and go and do the grown-up stuff which is sad 
which and is think, really sad it, yes let, you know let's also be realistic perhaps we do need to earn a living yeah but i think that it's how does that how does that earning a living support your passion you can, you can have both and i think we're not we're not shown we're not shown a way if you like of, of having this kind of a molded life it has a to life fit. rather than a career life, yes yeah <laughs> yes this kind of life can be lots of different things and you can still earn enough to put a, a yeah. roof over your head and food on the table and and survive well and live well not just survive actually absolutely not I just think you know, a lot of people are in yeah. survival mode with this or it's achievement mode yeah, yeah. Um, it's why I like, and gosh, this is going to be some long show notes, but it's why I really like that Japanese concept of Ikigai, because yes. it talks about the balance and the different areas in life um, to have a, a, a reason, Ikigai meaning reason for being, um, and then the different areas. So the thing that in Ikigai broadly is um, that the stuff that you're good at, the stuff that you love, the stuff that the world needs, and the stuff that you can get paid for. And some of them do intersect, but they don't all need to be the same thing. It's a Venn diagram, essentially, with um, four, four circles and um, they intersect, but they're not the same thing. So you can find something to be paid for um, and, and it can be something the world needs or that you're good at, or that you're passionate about. But you, the, the idea of balance and complete reason for being here is that you explore all of those areas and you find things in each of those areas. And of course, what the world needs and what you're good at and what you love, I could maybe combine those and you've got a clue as to where passion might sit. And it's the, what you get paid for. Yeah, you need to pay the bills. We all need to pay the bills, but we don't all need as many of the things that we think we do to be happy. Yeah. You're a pair of hippies, Jane, aren't we, eh? Yeah, well, it's the... <laughs> well, I love the life wheel. You know, the life wheel is such a simple tool to, do, to, to present with clients. I usually do it right at the beginning when I'm working with them on any career plan. And it, they, I go, OK, is your, is your spokes of your wheel? Right in those spokes, what are the really important things that you have to have in your life? And they, you know, they spend a good half an hour, maybe an hour thinking about it. And it's all, you know, make it as specific and as granular as possible. Now, how satisfied are you with, with those areas of your life? Okay. And often it's out of sync. You know, they spent all their focus maybe on the career, none on their fun or their, uh, you know, their hobby or their family or their friends or whatever it else it is they've put around their wheel. Mm. I had one, uh, I did this in a, gr a big group setting and it's so powerful. So this doctor said, you know, I've just done my wheel and, everything I will I've not looked at that for a year or more mm. she was absolutely nearly burnt out and it's hardly surprising is it you know but this is what we expect of people go to work earn the money do the thing but actually do not engage with your whole self how can mm. anyone live like that truthfully and this is mm. this is this is the impact this is why we've got so much mental health um mental health issues now in in the workplace personally I think and lost days it's yeah. costing business it's absolutely ridiculous you know it's, it's a nonsense really I mean, I'm going to, i've got a stat here somewhere i'm sure about how many lost days yet yeah, 17.9 million days lost to mental health issues because we're just yeah. not happy at work and it's not just that, is it? If I'm going, I think we probably need to wrap up um, timing wise. I suppose my my wrap up on this, if I'm going to tie it back to something you know business related, is exactly that. It's the loss, the impact on on mental health, <clears throat> but it's also a broader impact. You know, when you talk about um, issues of ethics or customer service um, or uh, service deliveries, it sometimes gets called the things that cause businesses real problems. There are people who are disconnected from their humanity. Somebody who hasn't paid attention to the human at the other end of the process we think about that the question asked the question the other day how did somebody end up chopping half a tomato in half wrapping it in cling film and giving it to putting it in a lunch in a food parcel for kids and thinking that was okay because the corporate machine has required them to disconnect from their humanity and if the paradigm that you are following is that passion is not needed here humanity love joy trust connection is not needed here that's not necessary to do what we need to do in business that stuff is going to come back and bite you on the bum personally and organizationally and commercially in lots of many, many different ways. That's it for and, me. And I'm going to end on a more of a light, light hearted um, 
just just to be different really and it was something that I heard at Kindfest but I think it, it really just sums up everything we've been talking about and it's this question what is the ROI of your mum <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just that just for me is that it's it's, it's the heart of why we're here yeah. that's why we're talking about passion we've forgotten what it means to love mm. why are we going to work why if we can't bring our whole selves and our hearts there's no point for me yeah. anyway Thank you, Jane. Probably wasn't that lighthearted, actually, in the end, but yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> this the ROI of your mum. <laughs> that is important. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank Me you. Too. <laughs> I always love talking to you. And we you, meandered, yeah. but I loved the meander. It was a wonderful journey. <laughs> yeah, we should have. We should do like an audience with, with us for, on a regular basis, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> You, we'll, you can join in next time and we'll just have a right good old ramble. <laughs> I've got some favourite episodes of the podcast and there are some individual excerpts that really mean something to me. For International Women's Day, we'll be editing them together for a special edition of the podcast. I mention it because I could quite easily have put pretty much all of this episode into that special episode. This was engaging, organic, entertaining. And I've listened to it, this is the fifth time now, <laughs> and I pick something else up from it every time I come back to it. I want to say a massive thank you to Jane and Lorna for such a great podcast. Their details are in the show notes and the dozens and dozens of links and topics and content that they identified are also there as well. Next week, something special. You'll get to hear the live episode that we recorded at a conference, albeit a virtual conference, the other week. You will not want to miss that one either. We have had an enormous surge in interest in speakers and our rosters are filling up wonderfully. If you want to join them, just please get in touch. If you don't want to join them, but you can think of somebody who would be a good speaker, tell them, ask them to get in touch. Or even if you just want to point people towards some of your favourite episodes. Once again, thank you for listening, and we'll see you again soon. You have been listening to the Women Talking About Learning podcast. Women Talking About Learning is available on all podcast platforms, including Apple and Google Podcasts. You'll also find us on Spotify, Amazon Music, and other music streaming services. Make sure to like and subscribe. It helps more people find us. You can find out more about Women Talking About Learning via our website, womentalkingaboutlearning.com. Make sure you tune in next time for more Women Talking About Learning more of the signal and none of the noise.